Um, for those of you who may be here for the very first time, if you're a visitor or if it's just been a few weeks since you've been here, you may not know that our lead pastor, Scott Ancaro, has just started his sabbatical, his long-awaited sabbatical for the summer. We are very excited for him and his family, both for his sake and for what we believe is going to be the fruit that will be borne out for us as a church. So we're so thrilled for him. But that means we have lined up a bunch of speakers throughout the summer. Um, uh, Joel was here with us last week. He's been a friend of the Foundry. This week we will have uh, uh, Josh Burnett who uh, some of you know him and Sarah and his awesome kids because they attend here at the Foundry. But for those of you who may not know him, Josh uh, actually planted a church in 2009 in Revolution, it's called Revolution in Annapolis. And um, that was actually the church that helped plant this church, the Foundry. They sent Scott here and um, in 2009, um, he started that church. We planted this church t about 10 years ago. And Josh has served on the oversight team. He's been providing guidance and care to Scott since day one of the planting of this church. Then in 2019, he stepped out of full-time pastoral ministry, and he started a company called Flourish that uses, it like pairs organizations like churches and nonprofits with technology that helps bring about the flourishing, the kingdom mindset here in our communities. And with his pastoral heart and being like neck deep in the tech world, Josh has really unique insight into the things that like grab our attention, uh, which might be the most valuable commodity right now in tech is our attention. So he's just going to speak to us. We're going to start a three-week series today. He's going to uh, call our attention to our attention, and he's going to tell us what God's word is on the subject. So would you welcome Josh as he comes up? <laughs> Thank you, Katie, and thanks for clapping. That was really kind of you. I'm, I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're going to kick off a new series today called Attention, um, and, uh, and I'm going to kick it off by telling you a story about a guy named Matt Emmons. Uh, Matt Emmons, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2004, was uh, in the uh, Atlanta, Atlanta, Athens, sorry, Athens uh, Summer Olympics, and, uh, and he had one shot left. He was participating in the, like, sharpshooting, three-position uh, sharpshooting. He had one shot left uh, to seal a gold medal. And, uh, and he, he literally was so far ahead of everybody else that was competing with him uh, at this point that he only had to hit the target. He didn't have to hit a bullseye. He didn't even have to, like, get a score. He just had to put a bullet on the target in order to clinch the gold medal. And so he lines up his shot, and he fires, and he gets a perfect bullseye. The only problem is he hit the target to the left of his target. He hit somebody else's target. He hit a perfect bullseye, and yet he totally lost the gold medal. He ended up getting eighth. It's not funny. I feel really bad for him. He went on to win a whole bunch of other gold medals, so don't worry about it. He's good now. But uh, he, he, completely, he completely missed the target that he was aiming at, even though he hit a perfect bullseye. And the, the truth is, you know, I think that's just a beautiful illustration for how our attention actually functions. Because the things that we think about, the things that we focus on, and the things that we allow ourselves to pay attention to actually shape and mold us in ways that, in a lot of ways, that we don't even understand uh, oftentimes. And so we end up with these results in our lives that aren't what we desired, aren't what we wanted, even though we thought we were going to hit the bullseye. And so that's kind of what we're going to be taking a look at over the next three weeks, is how our attention shapes and molds and defines our lives. And we're going to take a look at three different things. Today we're just going to talk about how our attention actually functions and how to train our attention in the way that we want it to go. Uh, next week we're going to talk about how worry affects our ability to live the life that we were created and designed uh, to live. And we're going to take a look at the words of Jesus about worry and how we can actually apply those to our lives. Um, and, then, and then finally, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject in church, money. I know you can't wait. That's two weeks from now. 
you'll all be here and you'll have your friends with you that don't know and love and follow Jesus. I'm, it's going to be awesome, I promise. Now, uh, we're, we're going to take a look at money and how money actually causes us to focus on things that we may not actually want to be focusing on simply by nature of the fact that we kind of got to have it in order to survive, right? And so, uh, so we'll jump into that. But today what we're going to look at is how our attention actually functions and how it shapes and molds our lives, even if we don't mean for it to, um, and how it can kind of be co-opted. Now, you may think like, Josh, this isn't a TED Talk. Like, what are you doing? Are we going to talk about the Bible at all? Um, yes, we are, okay? We're going to jump into the Bible in just a second. Um, it, it, it's actually, it's an interesting thing because while today we think about attention in a very specific way, and what I'm going to be addressing is, you know, a lot of how technology uh, functionally causes us to focus on and pay attention to things. Um, the reality is, it, even though the scriptures were, you know, like completed like 2,000 years ago, they say a lot about how we live and how we focus and how we pay attention. In fact, even in the Old Testament, we see uh, God commanding his people uh, over and over and over again to pay attention. The, the command, pay attention, occurs in Scripture 50 times. And beyond that, uh, the, the, the command to be wise and discerning in the way in which you live, to be thoughtful about the things that you are thinking about and doing in your life is something that is basically on every single page of the scriptures. And so the Bible has a lot to say about how we pay attention. And in the early church, there was this guy named Paul who talked about paying attention a whole lot. Uh, Paul was uh, one of the, the early Christian kind of leaders, and he started a whole bunch of churches all over the world. I think we could pretty safely argue that if it weren't for Paul, we may not actually be here uh, talking about Jesus today. Um, he, he is, you know, it might have been somebody else, uh, obviously, but uh, Paul is responsible for a large portion of the church uh, being started all across the uh, existing world at that time or the known world at that time. And so Paul uh, says things throughout all of his letters to the churches that he started um, about, hey, you need to pay attention. You need to be wise. So like in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. He's saying pay attention to what's going on around you, what you're thinking about, what you're focusing on. Be wise about the way in which you live. But there's this one letter that he writes to a church in, in Philippi. It's actually like his most happy letter. So uh, if you want to read like a happy Paul letter, Philippians is where you want to go. Uh, if you want to read a really sarcastic letter from Paul, Galatians. It's awesome. I, that'll be the next series I do. Uh, it's my favorite, favorite book in the whole Bible. Uh, but Philippians is great too because it's very, very encouraging. The church in Philippi was a church that Paul had started. It's uh, in modern day Greece is where this city would have been uh, located. And, and Paul writes this letter to the Philippians after having started this church to encourage them uh, primarily around the idea of, of unity. He's talking to them about what it actually means to follow Jesus and to be in community with one another doing that. And so in terms of how we actually apply that to ourselves today, it's a really easy thing for us to kind of jump across the bridge of time and say, okay, like Paul is saying, hey, listen, we need to be unified. We need to love one another. We need to learn to get along with one another. He talks a lot about how to uh, handle disputes and arguments in the church and, and how to keep the unity of Jesus is the reason that we are coming together. He is the one who's rescued us, and he's who we need to be focusing on and becoming more like. And so, uh, it's a really great letter. And at the end of his letter in, uh, uh, to the Philippian church, Paul writes this. In chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he, he, he gives this exhortation uh, to kind of sum up everything that he has written. And, uh, and this, this is, uh, if you've done any time in church throughout your life, you've probably heard this quoted at least. Um, he says this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I like the way uh, Eugene Peterson paraphrases this section. He says, summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true, noble, noble reputable, 
authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you've learned from me and what you've heard and saw and realized. Do that, and the God who makes everything work together will work in you, uh, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. I love the way that ends there. I think that's such a beautiful way to put that, that God will take everything and work you into his most excellent harmonies. What's Paul saying here? He's saying you need to pay attention to what you're paying attention to. And so even though this is 2,000 years ago, the iPhone has not been invented. I mean, for crying out loud, the internet's not even around, right? Like, like the, the coolest invention of that day was the road. I know that sounds crazy. Literally, that's what Rome is like famous for, is creating this series of, inter- it was their internet, was the road back then, right? And so they could now travel relatively safely from city to city, and commerce was able to happen more easily, and so ideas are flowing, and people are moving, and it's a lot safer of an environment back then. And, and, and <laughs> You know, they don't have the distraction of a a phone in their back pocket like I do right now, getting text messages because my friends are funny and like to text me while I'm preaching. Uh, And yet, at the same time, Paul is saying it's really important that you think about what you think about. It's really important that you pay attention to what you're giving your attention to. And if it was true 2,000 years ago, pre-internet, pre-phone, you know, like pre, pre-smartphone, how much more true is that for us today? I mean, like, I don't know that we could possibly take this seriously enough. Because the reality is, with all of the distraction of the Roman world, they had nothing on us. It was easy, cake. If we went back then, we would be like the smartest people around. Not because our IQs would be higher than the people back then, but because we would be like able to focus so much more easily because we're used to being constantly barraged with distraction. Now, we'd all need a detox before we got to that point, but they didn't have half, they didn't have a hundredth of the distraction level that we do today. And so... How much more seriously do we need to take this? Attention, as defined by the American Psychology Association, is the state in which cognitive resources are being focused on certain aspects of the environment rather than others. I think a simpler way to say that would just be like, attention is how we spend our time. Like, it's how we spend our mental time, if not every other part of our time. And the truth of the matter is, what we'll, what we'll find as we dig into our attention a little bit, if, I don't know if you've like, stopped to think about what you think about recently, is that there is a whole, whole lot of stuff that we think about without ever thinking about the fact that we're thinking about it. I don't know if that makes sense, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so Katie mentioned this. Uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I uh, stepped out of uh, leading a church in Annapolis called Revolution to start this company called Flourish. Flourish is a tech company uh, that matches people who want to volunteer to opportunities to do that uh, with nonprofits based on their passion, skills, and schedule. We optimize the way nonprofits operate by allowing them to utilize volunteers in a specialized way so that you can use your uh, skills for the highest and best impact possible with a mission that you deeply care about. That's not me being a commercial for it. I'm not ready to match any of you to anything yet because we're still building stuff. However, I will tell you this. We have an app that we already have out in production. We have nonprofits that are using it. This is also not a commercial, just to be clear. Um, So uh, please don't think I'm trying to sell you that. I'm trying to sell you something else. Um, (laughs) We have this. (laughs) I'm trying to sell you. I'm trying to sell you how you think about what you think about. Um, so, um, so we have this app, and what we use it for is it's a guide for volunteers to become highly effective fundraisers for nonprofits, right? So it's a guide so that you can, not you necessarily you, but the royal you, right? Uh, so that you can, you can be generous with your time by connecting the people that you know to a nonprofit that you believe they would deeply care about with the potential of them saying, yeah, I want to donate to this organization. Like, 
we coach people to go first, donate, and then invite people to donate because nobody likes to be invited to a restaurant that, you know, like, oh, you're going to love this restaurant, and then you find out the person's never eaten there, and you're like, yeah, why? I'm never going to trust you again, right? So, so you donate first, then you invite people to donate, right? I know this is like way too in the weeds, and I will cut this out in second service, I assure you. Um, <clears throat> but here's my point. I tell you all of that to tell you this, right? So my intent in that app, our intent as a company in that app is to guide people to be generous in the way that they use their time and their relationships and their influence with others to expand generosity to create better outcomes in the world. In saying that, let me just tell you some things. We have found that through using push notifications and text messages, we can increase how many people you send a text message to inviting them to donate. Furthermore, we found that not only can we increase how many people you send that text message to, we can also increase the probability that that person is going to say yes to you simply by coaching you and guiding you and prompting you to t send the text message at the exact right time, between 5.30 and 8 p.m. Because it's 74% more likely that you'll get a response during that window of time. Furthermore, we figured out that if we give you some prompts and some coaching on what to say, that people are far more likely to respond than if I just said, hey, text some people and ask them to donate to this organization, right? And I know that sounds like manipulation because in some ways it kind of is. I'm sort of manipulating you to live the life you want to live a little bit, right? But here's the crazy thing about it. Even with all of the good intent in the world, we're still able to get people to do things that they may not actually do if we weren't prompting them to do them. And if you think I'm good, let me just tell you, our tech company is dirt poor compared to Google. I mean, we're not even like on this planet compared to Google or Facebook or any of the other tech companies out there. And so if you, if you have those apps on your phones, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you are being manipulated. You are being manipulated. And if you want proof of this, I can give you proof, especially if you have an iPhone. If you have an Android, I'm not sure if they do this, but um, I should know, but I don't know, because um, <clears throat> our app is also on Android. Again, not trying to sell you anything. Um, you'd have to be asked by a nonprofit, which is why I feel safe talking about it. Right, so let me just show you, like this, I'm, I'm going to be really, really transparent with you. Um, Apple has this thing called screen time. If you don't know about it and you have kids, you need to learn about screen time. Uh, it's a very, very important app. Um, and frankly, if you don't have kids, you still need to learn about it because it's a very important app because it will show you precisely how well they are manipulating you. Not just Apple, which by the way, the whole privacy thing, uh, this is going to be posted on the internet. I'm about to get just canceled by Apple hard. They're going to kick my app out of the app store and everything. But like, they're, like the privacy thing is like, yeah, we want to own all your data. That's what we want. Like, it's not about, anyhow, okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me just tell you, in the last week, I've, I've on average spent six hours and 42 minutes a day on my phone. Six hours and 42 minutes a day. Now, let me just tell you, I'm not on social media on my phone. I exclusively use social media for my work. So that's not counting social media time. And I do talk on my phone quite a lot, but six hours and 42 minutes a day, I'm on my phone. Let me just uh, give you some other stats. There's some great things on here. So like pickups, right? It'll tell you how many times you picked up your phone during the day. So today, just today, I have picked up my phone 83 times. It's 10.02, you guys. I've already picked up my phone 83 times. 83? Yeah, 83. Yesterday, I picked up my phone uh, 284 times, and uh, my, my daily average on pickups is 300 times a day that I pick up my phone and look at it. Now, most of that is because of notifications, which, by the way, today, and by the way, I'm super careful about who and what can give me a notification. I pay real close attention to that because, you know, I notify people uh, using apps. <laughs> uh, but today, just today, I've received 55 notifications already today. 
Now, a lot of that's text messages from my jerk friends who are texting me right now even while I'm preaching. Uh, but uh, the, the truth is we're being manipulated. We, and you can look at the data on your own phone to see how much control uh, these you know, companies have over our lives. And what we give our attention to is going to shape our lives. It's going to define the outcomes of our lives. The way that I would say it is this. If, if we are not attentive to our attention, we will be distracted from the life that God created and designed us to live. Inattention to our attention will lead to distraction from the life that God created and designed us to live. Another way to say it is this. If you do not manage your attention, someone else will. And quite frankly, they already are. They already are. So Paul's writing to this church, and he's telling them how to be the church, how to follow Jesus. And, and Paul's whole message in this is that our goal, our aim as followers of Jesus or Christians, Christian just means little Christ, little version of Jesus, or the way Dallas Willard likes to say it is, or used to say it, um, is being a Christian is becoming who Jesus would be if Jesus were you, right? That's what it means to, to follow Jesus, is to become who Jesus would be if Jesus were you. The version of you that God intended and Paul's saying, if that's your aim, if that's your goal, if your goal is to do that and then by becoming who Jesus would be if Jesus were you and living in community with others who are doing that in a grace-based way, knowing that we're going to mess up and we're not going to live the life that we uh, long for, but we're going to keep doing our best and encouraging one another to do that, that the goal of our presence in the world is that heaven would come to earth, that, that the same way Jesus came and, and lived among us and in so doing brought heaven to earth, that we are to be bringing heaven to earth in the spaces that we occupy and live and inhabit, then we've got to pay attention and we've got to make sure that the things that we're thinking about are the things that Jesus would have us think about. <clears throat> and the truth is, if I'm really honest with you, I think that other people value my attention far more than I do. I think that corporations value my attention far more than I do. Let me, I'll, I'll post this article later on today that these stats are from. It's from a bunch of different studies, but uh, it's a really good article that was posted on Medium, um, and it, it's talking about the value of attention today. And attention is far and away the most valuable commodity on our planet. Um, there, there's nothing that is more valuable than attention, not oil, not, like, like, like not anything, right? So, so if you were to guess, what would you guess Oh, wait. Okay, cool. Sweet. Thanks, Eric, for staying on top of things. If you were to guess, what would you say the, the value of your attention is per minute in, like, dollars and cents? What do you think your, your attention is worth per minute? Well, in 2021, I can tell you it was a dollar and three cents, your attention was worth a dollar and three cents per minute in 2021. It's worth more now. Somewhere to the tune of 25 to 50 cents per minute more now than it was in 2021. The average American spends 86% of their waking hours, so 13.1 hours a day, consuming media in various forms. So I was only talking about, that's six hours, that's only talking about my phone, that's not talking about all the other ways in which I consume media, right? It's not podcasts, that's not, uh, I listen to podcasts on my computer, that's why it's not included in there. Um, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not anything I watch on my TV, it's not the stuff that I see on ads. 86% of our waking time is spent 
consuming media. That's nine, or 791 minutes per day, which means that the value of your attention per day is $815 a day. You're, every single person in here, that's a lot of money just in this room right now. $5,700 a week, $24,000 a month, $300,000 a year, $2.5 million in the past 10 years has been spent on capturing your attention. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about my attention, which is super, super scattered, as I've already demonstrated this morning, I don't really think it's worth $2.5 million over the last 10 years. But other people do. And is it possible that if they would value our attention that highly that God actually values our attention even more than they do. Because I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to stand, like, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're here and you're trying to figure out what it is that you believe, like, we are so excited to have you here. Uh, What I'm about to say might sound weird and it might sound, you know, out there a little bit, but like if God is real and what we believe about Jesus is true and my job as a follower of Jesus is to bring heaven to earth, to become the version of me that God intended, I don't want to get to heaven one day and have, have Jesus look at me and say, Man, I'm super glad that you're here. And you've done some really awesome stuff. But I valued your attention at way more than $1.03 a day. And I had some stuff for you to do. Or I had some peace for you to experience. I had some relationships for you to invest in that you missed out on because you were not attentive to your attention. Is it possible that God values our attention far more than we ever imagine and that our attention is far more valuable than we ever imagined in the first place? And if so, what do we do about that? What do we do? How do we, how do we learn to focus our attention? Now, I could go into a whole lot of functional, like, hey, here's what you need to do to lock down your phone and, like, limit your notifications, which obviously I'm only partially living out at this stage of the game, in spite of the fact that I know how bad it is. But the thing that I would really love for us to do is simply kind of ask ourselves some questions and draw, the thing that I found most effective in my life is to draw my attention to the things that are capturing my attention. I try to look at my screen time every single day, and if you looked at my screen time charts over the last year and a half, what you would see is a steady decline in the amount of time I spend on my phone. When I first started tracking it, I was spending 14 hours a day on my phone. I was spending an hour and a half on Instagram, not like any kind of intentional, like programmed it into my day, because I feel like if somebody wanted an hour and a half of my day every single day, it would have to live on my calendar, and yet I was spending an hour and a half on Instagram every single day. Last week, I didn't look at it one time. That is not yay Josh. That is just once you start looking at what it's actually costing you, it will lead you to be more intentional. So what we need is to become aware. To illustrate this, I'd love to give you an awareness test. Are you ready? Some of you are like, I hate this sermon and I'm never coming back. (laughs) I'm sorry. All right, let's roll the awareness. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? (laughs) 
Maybe you've already seen that. It's an old video, I know. So sorry if that was like old news or whatever. But it's a great illustration of the fact that it's really, really easy when we're not paying attention to miss something that's right in front of our face and super easy to see if you're, unless you're being distracted. And so what I want to encourage us to do over the next three weeks is to begin to become more aware of what we are giving our attention to. And there's a few ways that practical steps that I want to give you that you can, you can take to, uh, to do that. So the first is to do an attention audit. Um, <clears throat> how are you actually spending your time in your life? Um, and and to, really, to really look at this from the perspective of, um, am I thinking about things that are good, that are noble, that are true? Am I giving my time and attention, or is my time and attention being focused on things that are not good, that are not noble, that are not true? Look, like, I'm a fan of streaming. I'm super happy that there's like a bajillion different streaming platforms. If I would have showed you my actual screen, you would have seen that Peacock had like two hours on it yesterday because I've been binging uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, <clears throat> just to be really honest with you, I'm about to binge Ted Lasso season three. Um, uh, that's not an endorsement on any of that front. But at any rate, um, once we become aware and actually start looking at the things that we are giving our time and attention to, and there are very tangible ways in which we can do this, it will change the way that we live and act. It might be slow like me, or maybe you'll just like, boom, everything will change overnight, which would be great and more power to you, and you can preach the sermon next year if you want. Um, <clears throat> but on your phone, look at, look at your text threads. Go through your text threads and ask yourself, if I'm holding this up against the lens of Paul's words to the church in Philippi, are, are the threads that I'm participating in, are the messages that I'm sending and receiving, are they leading me to think about things that are good, things that are noble, things that are true? Are they leading me to become the person who's going to bring heaven to earth more, or are they distracting me from that? Look at your social media. Look at the feeds that you're being fed. Begin to really think about how you manage that. I would encourage you to just turn off all social media notifications, no matter what. Like, like just turn them off. They're, they're worthless. I'm just telling you right now, they're a complete manipulation. <clears throat> Look at the podcast that you're listening to. Look at the, the things that you're uh, watching, your shows. Look at your relationships with your friends, your family. Ask yourself, are these relationships feeding into me thinking about things that are good, that are noble, that are pure? Are these relationships, relationships that are helping me bring heaven to earth? And that's not to say that every relationship we have should be like that. In some ways, we, need, we, we all need relationships where we're feeding into other people and bringing heaven to earth in their life. But do you have other relationships that are feeding you becoming who God created and designed you to be, focusing on and giving attention to the things that God would have you look at? Next, you can pray. That sounds really general and really hard to apply, right? Like, I don't know if you're like, I love prayer, but I've not found that most people are in that place, even Christians, right? But one of the things that I've found that is a beautiful way to begin to practice uh, and build into your life uh, a rhythm of prayer is to just practice gratitude, to thank God for the things that are good in your life, to focus on the things that are good in your life. My brother-in-law uh, was uh, a part of a, a group where they had to every single day write down a hundred things that they were grateful for that day, and they could not repeat anything, and they did it for like six months. And I was like, how did you do it? He was like, I was literally at a point where I was like, thank you for Chewbacca, thank you for, like, I mean, he was just naming, like, thank you for that flower on the ground, like, he, but, but it truly transformed his life in a way that was incredible to me, just to see him develop this rhythm of gratitude to God. Pray for other people. Next, you can read scripture. If you're like trying to figure out where to start on that front, uh, I would encourage you to start with the book of John in the New Testament. It tells the story of Jesus, and you'll get to interact with Jesus and meet Jesus. You don't have to read much. Read three, four verses a day and just think about them, reflect on them. In scripture, you're going to learn who God is. You're going to learn 
who you are and what God thinks about you. You're going to learn how to live the life that you were created and designed for by watching Jesus live that life. And you're going to learn what it means to live in community with others in grace-based relationships where we love and encourage one another as we collectively work to bring heaven to earth. And then finally, I'd encourage you to just reflect. Start a journal, or if you already have one, add a, add a little section to it every day of like, here's what I thought about today. And just think about what you thought about. And hold it up to the lens of Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and see if it doesn't start to turn the things that you are thinking about and paying attention to. We're going to go into a time of communion right now, and this is a beautiful, beautiful time collectively for us as a church to give our attention to the love of God demonstrated through Jesus for us. That God would send his only son to pay the price for our brokenness and the ways in which we are not living the life that he created and designed us to live so that we could be drawn to that life. And every time we participate in communion, collectively what we're doing is we're recognizing the goodness of God, the love of God, and the grace of God by holding a cup with a little broken piece of cracker in it that represents Jesus' body that was broken for us, by holding a little cup of juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out, not spilled, it was not unintentional, heaven invaded earth for the purpose of restoring us to the relationship that we were designed to have with God and to become the people who God created and intended us to be so that heaven would fully come through our participation in that. And so this is why we participate in communion every single week. It's to remind ourselves, to draw our attention to the thing that binds us together. So we have four stations in the room. Uh, they're all gluten-free, uh, two in the front, two in the back. Um, band's going to play, and we're going um, to have some time now to reflect and to draw our attention to the goodness of God that we might become more and more of the people that God created and designed us to be. Let me pray for us, and then we'll receive communion. God, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you that, I just thank you for the opportunity to, to be in this space as a community and to draw and focus our attention on who you are, on how you love us, and to allow that to just fill us and guide us to become the people that you created and designed us to be. We thank you for Jesus, that he loved us so much that he would lay down his own life that we might have the life that you designed us for. And so it's in his name that we pray and receive. Amen.